patient was pre-op for an incision and drainage IND, of the left knee and shoulder that had gone septic. When the patient developed AFib, they put her on anticoagulation therapy of heparin. Pre-surgery, she was running on continuous heparin, and then after surgery was completed, the patient was ordered continuous heparin to resume. However, the communication was not put through properly. I was assigned the patient the day before she went to surgery. Then my preceptor and I resumed her care two days later. It wasn't until those two days post-op that pharmacy called up and asked if the patient was still on the heparin drip. Confused, since we had never been told about that in report, I checked the progress notes put into the computer and found that the surgical physicians and medical residents were all charting the heparin was running continuously. After calling through to many of the physicians and residents, it was discovered that the heparin had never been discontinued, only stopped pre-surgery and expected to restart at post-op. After the error was discovered and after the patient had not been receiving heparin for two days post-surgery, another order was put in to restart the continuous heparin drip. Overall, the actions that I and the other nurse took were, upon realizing something wasn't right, we looked in the chart to see if something had been misdocumented. Then once we found a discrepancy, we called the doctors and residents to bring the problem to their attention. Lastly, after fixing the problem and restarting the continuous heparin drip, we proceeded to monitor patient safety for signs of DVTs and other complications. The outcome for this critical incident was that after we discovered that a continuous heparin drip had been wanted to be started by the physicians after surgery, but we had not seen an order for one, we immediately called down to the pharmacy and explained what had happened. We drew a new PTT lab and started a new drip and bolus based on the value. The physician put in a new order into the MAR to make sure that the communication would not break down this time. We continued to monitor the patient for adverse reactions to the heparin drip as well as complications from not having heparin post-op for two days. In this situation, because the heparin was not discontinued, it was communicated that heparin should not be stopped. However, since a new specific order was not put in to restart the heparin directly after surgery, it was a relatively easy thing to misunderstand. I should have read the order more closely to ensure I was doing what was ordered and to ensure safety of the patient. This mistake of not reading the order poses an issue with the ethical principle of non-maleficence, since it is our duty as nurses to keep patients safe and prevent harm to them. By not administering the heparin, the patient could have suffered from DVTs or other related complications. The falsifying of information by the physicians and residents poses issues with the ethical principle of veracity. However, it was definitely not intentional. When they went in to check up on the patient post-op, there was an IV bag of antibiotics and normal saline hanging, so I guess they assumed it was the heparin infusing as ordered. Healthcare providers are ethically responsible to tell the truth to patients and to fellow providers. On the doctor's part, by not making sure that the bags that were hanging were in fact heparin, they were not able to keep to the ethical principle of veracity when documenting information. Professional issues associated with this critical incident include when and how to let the patient know there was a mistake in providing care. If an incident report had been written, it would not be included in the patient's chart. However, there is an ethical choice of whether the patient should be told about the incident or not. In this case, my preceptor and I decided it was best to let the patient know there had been a miscommunication when we went in to draw a new PTT lab. She was understanding of the mistake. Perhaps to decrease events like this in the future, another professional issue that the hospital could look into would be implementing a standardized handoff communication routine between surgery, PACU, and the floor. According to research done by Petrovic et al., the implementation of a standardized handoff communication tool can help to reduce communication errors by up to 77%. In their research, they tried out a new checklist-based handoff tool to be used between OR and PACU nurses and physicians. The handoff took on average 11 minutes to complete and was done at the patient bedside. Seeing as communication issues during handoff are responsible for many patient injuries and deaths each year, the implementation of a tool like this could be worthwhile.